This is a video on serotonin syndrome. I'll be discussing the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of serotonin syndrome. As in all of these videos, the color coding is on the top right here, and I'll be clearing all of the boxes and repopulating the flowchart one by one as we talk about each concept. Let's go ahead and get started with serotonin syndrome. The central problem here is that you have excess serotonin, and this usually comes from serotonergic drugs. Now there's a long list of these, and it's worth going through them pretty quickly just so that you're able to recognize which medications contain serotonin or have serotonergic activity. The first bucket here, antidepressants, is probably the biggest and the most major for serotonin syndrome. Antidepressants contain SSRIs, SNRIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, and others like trazodone. Next, anticonvulsants like valproate have serotonergic activity. Some opioids like tramadol and meperidine. Some anti-nausea medications like odansetron, which is a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist. Some angiolytics like buspirone. NMDA receptor agonists like dextromethorphan has serotonergic activity. Serotonin receptor agonists like triptans and ritonavir. So triptans, for instance, might be used for migraines. So it might be a uh, patient taking medication for something completely unrelated to depression or mental health that, that, uh, that can cause serotonin syndrome. Next, some antibiotics like linazolid, some herbal supplements like St. John's wort, ginseng, and tryptophan. Tr uh, serotonin is actually made of the amino acid tryptophan, so that, that makes sense here as well. Lastly, some rec recreational stimulants like MDMA and cocaine can all cause serotonin syndrome. Now, usually it's not taking one of these medications in isolation as prescribed um, with a correct prescription that causes serotonin syndrome. There's usually another problem, and I'm going to kind of list those other problems, those other factors here. So usually it's taking two or more serotonergic drugs concurrently. This might be two medications prescribed from different doctors that aren't communicating, or perhaps one doctor that doesn't realize that linazolid has strong um, serotonergic properties. So. Um, you always want to make sure you double check your medications and make sure there's not going to be any kind of interactions like this. Switching between serotonergic drugs can precipitate serotonin syndrome if you don't have time for tapering. So if a patient is switching from an SSRI to an SNRI, you need to slowly taper in between those medications to avoid serotonin syndrome. Drug overdose, whether it's intentional or accidental, can precipitate serotonin syndrome. And taking at least one of these serotonergic drugs with a CYP450 inhibitor can also cause serotonin syndrome. So the CYP450 inhibitors, there's a long list of these medications. We're not going to go through them here. One example is ciprofloxacin, probably one of the more common um, antibiotics that you might use. It's a CYP450 inhibitor, and it's worth thinking through the pathophysiology of how this might result in more serotonin activity in the body. So when you have a medication like ciprofloxacin that's a CYP450 inhibitor, it's going to decrease CYP450 activity. This is an enzyme that is in the liver that's responsible for drug clearance. And if you're decreasing that enzyme, you're gonna decrease your rate of drug clearance. This allows the serotonergic drug to accumulate and that's gonna increase your serotonergic activity. So it's worth thinking through that to help you understand why a serotonergic drug with a CYP450 inhibitor might result in increased serotonergic activity. Lastly, there are some patient-specific pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic factors that might be at play here. These are not super well understood yet. They're largely genetic and hereditary, but they can definitely predispose somebody to serotonin syndrome, and you might not realize it when prescribing medications. So again, you could have some genetic or hereditary reason to have decreased CYP450 activity, and the same pathophysiology here would apply. And you can also have a polymorphism in the serotonin receptor, for instance, that might make it extra sensitive to an otherwise normal dose of antidepressant, for instance. So now let's work our way toward the manifestations. How does this excess serotonin lead to the manifestations of serotonin syndrome? Well, first, there's a lot of manifestations that come from the brain. So serotonin at high levels reaches the central nervous system. It then stimulates the postsynaptic receptors 5-HT1A and 5 ht 2A. And this is where you're going to get your major classic manifestations, your classic triad of serotonin syndrome. The classic triad is autonomic dysfunction, neuromuscular excitability, which results in hyperthermia, 
and altered mental status. So let's go into these and talk about specifically what we're talking about. So first, altered or autonomic dysfunction, that can be diaphoresis or sweating, tachycardia, hypertension, or midriasis. This is very dilated pupils. Neuromuscular excitability can be hyperreflexia, myoclonus, clonus, horizontal ocular clonus, hypertonicity, and rigidity, especially rigidity in the lower extremities. And when you have this high level of neuromuscular excitability, if you're not able to control it, if you're not able to relax, it can lead to hyperthermia. And we'll later see how this, when it's really bad, can potentially lead to rhabdomyolysis. Altered mental status, this can include delirium, psychomotor agitation, and in severe cases, coma. Some other symptoms you might get are anxiety, seizures, and in the case of monoamine oxidase inhibitor toxicity, you could have hypotension from very high levels of MAOIs. Lastly, let's discuss some complications from serotonin syndrome. I already mentioned this first one, rhabdomyolysis can come from extremely high levels of neuromuscular excitability and hyperthermia, so that can result in rhabdomyolysis. This can also damage your kidneys. Uh, next, serotonin has a role in modulating your GI mobility, and that can result in GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Serotonin can also cause bronchoconstriction, which can result in acute respiratory distress syndrome. It also causes vasoconstriction, which can, acute, which can result in acute kidney injury. And again, rhabdo might also precipitate that acute kidney injury as well. Lastly, excess serotonin can stimulate platelet aggregation, which can cause disseminated intravascular coagulation. So this has been a quick overview of serotonin syndrome. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.